Section 2 of Inca Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inca Lands by Hiram Bingham. Chapter 1. Crossing the Desert. Part 2. On the 2nd of October, Tucker, Hinckley, Corporal Gamarra, and I left Arequipa. Watkins followed a week later. The first stage of the journey was by train from Arequipa to Vitor, a distance of 30 miles. The arriero sent the cargo along, too. In addition to the food boxes, we brought with us tents, ice axes, snowshoes, barometers, thermometers, transit, fiber cases, steel boxes, duffel bags, and a folding boat. Our pack train was supposed to have started from Arequipa the day before. We hoped it would reach Vitor about the same time that we did, but that was expecting too much of arrieros on the first day of their journey, so we had an all-day wait near the primitive little railway station. We amused ourselves wandering off over the neighboring Pampa and studying the Medanos, crescent-shaped sand dunes which are common in the great coastal desert. One reads so much of the great tropical jungles of South America, and of well-nigh impenetrable forests that it is difficult to realize that the west coast from Ecuador on the north to the heart of Chile on the south is a great desert, broken at intervals by oases or valleys whose rivers, coming from melting snows of the Andes, are here and there diverted for purposes of irrigation. Lima, the capital of Peru, is in one of the largest of these oases. Although frequently enveloped in a damp fog, the Peruvian coastal towns are almost never subjected to rain. The causes of this phenomenon are easy to understand. Winds coming from the east, laden with the moisture of the Atlantic Ocean and the steaming Amazon basin, are rapidly cooled by the eastern slopes of the Andes and forced to deposit this moisture in the montaña. By the time the winds have crossed the mighty cordillera, there is no rain left in them. Conversely, the winds that come from the warm Pacific Ocean strike a cold area over the frigid Humboldt current, which sweeps up along the west coast of South America. This cold belt wrings the water out of the westerly winds, so that by the time they reach the warm land, their relative humidity is low. To be sure, there are months in some years when so much moisture falls on the slopes of the coast range that the hillsides are clothed with flowers, but this verdure lasts but a short time and does not seriously affect the great stretches of desert pampa, in the midst of which we now were. Like the other pampas of this region, the flat surface inclines toward the sea. Over it, the sand is rolled along by the wind and finally built into crescent-shaped dunes. These medanos interested us greatly. The prevailing wind on the desert at night is a relatively gentle breeze that comes down from the cool mountain slopes toward the ocean. It tends to blow the lighter particles of sand along in a regular dune, rolling it over and over downhill, leaving the heavier particles behind. This is reversed in the daytime. As the heat increases toward noon, the wind comes rushing up from the ocean to fill the vacuum caused by the rapidly ascending currents of hot air that rise from the overheated pampas. During the early afternoon, this wind reaches a high velocity and swirls the sand along in clouds. It is now strong enough to move the heavier particles of sand uphill. It sweeps the heaviest ones around the base of the dune and deposits them in pointed ridges on either side. The heavier material remains stationary at night, while the lighter particles are rolled downhill, but the whole mass travels slowly uphill again during the gales of the following afternoon. The result is the beautiful crescent-shaped medano. About five o'clock our mules, a fine-looking lot, far superior to any that we had been able to secure near Cusco, trotted briskly into the dusty little plaza. It took some time to adjust the loads, and it was nearly seven o'clock before we started off in the moonlight for the oasis of Vitor. As we left the plateau and struck the dusty trail winding down into a dark canyon, we caught a glimpse of something white, shimmering faintly on the horizon far off to the northwest. Coropuna. Shortly before nine o'clock we reached a little corral, where the mules were unloaded. For ourselves we found a shed with a clean stone-paved floor, where we set up our cots, only to be awakened many times during the night by passing caravans anxious to avoid the terrible heat of the desert by day. Where the oases are only a few miles apart, one often travels by day, 
but when crossing the desert is a matter of eight or ten hours steady jogging with no places to rest no water no shade the pack animals suffer greatly consequently most caravans travel so far as possible by night our first desert the pampa of siwas was reported to be narrow so we preferred to cross it by day and see what was to be seen we got up about half past four and were off before seven then our troubles began either because he lived in arequipa or because they thought he looked like a good horseman or for reasons best known to themselves the tejadas had given mr hinckley a very spirited saddle mule the first thing i knew her rider carrying a heavy camera a package of plate holders and a large mercurial barometer borrowed from the harvard observatory was pitched headlong into the sand fortunately no damage was done and after a lively chase the runaway mule was brought back by corporal gamarra after mr hinckley was remounted on his dangerous mule we rode on for a while in peace between cornfields and vineyards over paths flanked by willows and fig trees the chief industry of vitor is the making of wine from vines which date back to colonial days the wine is aged in huge jars each over six feet high buried in the ground we had a glimpse of seventeen of them standing in a line awaiting sale it made one think of ali baba and the forty thieves who would have had no trouble at all hiding in these cyclopean crocks the edge of the oasis of vitor is the contour line along which the irrigating canal runs there is no gradual petering out of foliage the desert begins with a stunning crash on one side is the bright luxurious green of fig trees and vineyards on the other side is the absolute stark nakedness of the sandy desert within the oasis there is an abundance of water much of it runs to waste the wine growers receive more than they can use in fact more land could easily be put under cultivation the chief difficulties are the scarcity of ports from which produce can be shipped to the outer world the expense of the transportation system of pack trains over the deserts which intervene between the oases and the railroad and the lack of capital otherwise the irrigation system might be extended over great stretches of rich volcanic soil now unoccupied a steady climb of three-quarters of an hour took us to the northern rim of the valley here we again saw the snowy mass of coropuna glistening in the sunlight seventy-five miles away to the northwest our view was a short one for in less than three minutes we had to descend another canyon we crossed this and climbed out on the pampa of siwas there was little to interest us in our immediate surroundings but in the distance was coropuna and i had just begun to study the problem of possible routes for climbing the highest peak when mr hinckley's mule trotted briskly across the trail directly in front of me kicked up her heels and again sent him sprawling over the sand barometer camera plates and all unluckily this time his foot caught in a stirrup and still holding the bridle he was dragged some distance before he got it loose he struggled to his feet and tried to keep the mule from running away when a violent kick released his hold and knocked him out we immediately set up our little mummery tent on the hot sandy floor of the desert and rendered first aid to the unlucky astronomer we found that the sharp point of one of the vicious mule's new shoes had opened a large vein in mr hinckley's leg the cut was not dangerous but too deep for successful mountain climbing with gamarra's aid mr hinckley was able to reach arequipa that night but his enforced departure not only shattered his own hopes of climbing coropuna but also made us wonder how we were going to have the necessary three men on the rope when we reached the glaciers to be sure there was the corporal but would he go indians do not like snow mountains packing up the tent again we resumed our course over the desert the oasis of siwas another beautiful garden in the bottom of a huge canyon was reached about four o'clock in the afternoon we should have been compelled to camp in the open with the arreros had not the parish priest invited us to rest in the cool shade of his vine-covered arbor he graciously served us with cakes and sweet native wine and asked us to stay as long as we liked the desert of majes which now lay ahead of us is perhaps the widest hottest and most barren in this region our arrieros were unwilling to cross it in the daytime they said it was forty-five miles between water and water the next day we enjoyed the hospitality of our kindly host until after supper 
so sure are the inhabitants of these oases that it is not going to rain that their houses are built merely as a shelter against the sun and wind they are made of the canes that grow in the jungles of the larger river bottoms or along the banks of irrigating ditches on the roof the spaces between the canes are filled with adobe sun-dried mud it is not necessary to plaster the sides of the houses for it is pleasant to let the air have free play and it is amusing to look out through the cracks and see everything that is passing that evening we saddled in the moonlight slowly we climbed out of the valley to spend the night jogging steadily hour after hour across the desert as the moon was setting we entered a hilly region and at sunrise found ourselves in the midst of a tumbled mass of enormous sand dunes the result of hundreds of medanos blown across the pampa of majes and deposited along the border of the valley it took us three hours to wind slowly down from the level of the desert to a point where we could see the great canyon a mile deep and two miles across its steep sides are of various colored rocks and sand the bottom is a bright green oasis through which flows the rapid majes river too deep to be forded even in the dry season a very large part of the flood plain of the unruly river is not cultivated and consists of a wild jungle difficult of access in the dry season and impossible when the river rises during the rainy months the contrast between the gigantic hills of sand and the luxurious vegetation was very striking but to us the most beautiful thing in the landscape was the long glistening white mass of coropuna now much larger and just visible above the opposite rim of the valley at eight o'clock in the morning as we were wondering how long it would be before we could get down to the bottom of the valley and have some breakfast we discovered at a place called pitas or cerro colorado a huge volcanic boulder covered with rude pictographs further search in the vicinity revealed about one hundred of these boulders each with its quota of crude drawings i did not notice any ruins of houses near the rocks neither of the tejada brothers who had been passed here many times nor any of the natives of this region appear to have any idea of the origin or meaning of this singular collection of pictographic rocks the drawings represented jaguars birds men and dachshund like dogs they deserved careful study yet not even the interest and excitement of investigating the rocas jeroglificos as they are called here could make us forget that we had had no food or sleep for a good many hours so after taking a few pictures we hastened on and crossed the majes river on a very shaky temporary bridge it was built to last only during the dry season to construct a bridge which would withstand floods is not feasible at present we spent the day at coriri a pleasant little village where it was almost impossible to sleep on account of the myriads of gnats the next day we had a short ride along the western side of the valley to the town of aplau the capital of the province of castilla called by its present inhabitants majes although on raimondi's map that name is applied only to the river and the neighboring desert in eighteen sixty five at the time of his visit it had a bad reputation for disease now it seems more healthy the sub-prefect of castilla had been informed by telegraph of our coming and invited us to an excellent dinner the people of majes are largely of mixed white and indian ancestry many of them appeared to be unusually businesslike the proprietor of one establishment was a great admirer of american shoes the name of which he pronounced in a manner that puzzled us for a long time w is unknown in spanish and the letters a l and k are never found in juxtaposition when he asked us what we thought of valucofer accenting strongly the last syllable we could not imagine what he meant he was equally at a loss to understand how we could be so stupid as not to recognize immediately the well-advertised name of a widely known shoe at majes we observed cotton which is sent to the mills at arequipa alfalfa highly prized as fodder for pack animals sugar-cane from which aguardiente or white rum is made and grapes it is said that the majes vineyards date back to the sixteenth century and that some of the huge buried earthenware wine jars now in use were made as far back as the reign of philip the second the presence of so much wine in the community does not seem to have a deleterious effect on the natives who were not only hospitable but energetic far more so in fact than the natives of towns in the high andes 
where the intense cold and the difficulty of making a living have reacted upon the indians often causing them to be morose sullen and without ambition the residences of the wine growers are sometimes very misleading a typical country house of the better class is not much to look at its long low flat roof and rough unwhitewashed mud-colour walls give it an unattractive appearance yet to one's intense surprise the inside may be clean and comfortable with modern furniture a piano and a phonograph our conscientious and hard-working arrieros rose at two o'clock the next morning for they knew their mules had a long hard climb ahead of them from an elevation of one thousand feet above sea level to ten thousand feet after an all-day journey we camped at a place where forage could be obtained we had now left the region of tropical products and come back to potatoes and barley the following day a short ride brought us past another pictographic rock recently blasted open by an energetic treasure seeker of chuquibamba this town has three thousand inhabitants and is the capital of the province of condesuyos it was the place which we had selected several months before as the rendezvous for the attack on coropuna the climate here is delightful and the fruits and cereals of the temperate zone are easily raised the town is surrounded by gardens vineyards alfalfa and grain fields all showing evidence of intensive cultivation it is at the head of one of the branches of the majes valley and is surrounded by high cliffs the people of chuquibamba were friendly we were kindly welcomed by senor benavides the sub-prefect who hospitably told us to set up our cots in the grand salon of his own house here we received calls from the local officials including the provincial physician dr pastor and the director of the colegio nacional professor alejandro coelho the last two were keen to go with us up mount coropuna they told us that there was a hill near by called the calvario whence the mountain could be seen and offered to take us up there we accepted thinking at the same time that this would show who was best fitted to join in the climb for we needed another man on the rope professor coelho easily distanced the rest of us and won the coveted place from the calvario hill we had a splendid view of those white solitudes whither we were bound now only twenty-five miles away it seemed clear that the western or truncated peak which gives its name to the mass coro cut off at the top puna a cold snowy height was the highest point of the range and higher than all the eastern peaks yet behind the flat top dome we could just make out a northerly peak tucker wondered whether or not that might prove to be higher than the western peak which we decided to climb no one knew anything about the mountain there were no native guides to be had the wildest opinions were expressed as to the best routes and methods of getting to the top we finally engaged a man who said he knew how to get to the foot of the mountain so we called him guide for want of a more appropriate title the peruvian spring was now well advanced and the days were fine and clear it appeared however that there had been a heavy snowstorm on the mountain a few days before if summer were coming unusually early it behooved us to waste no time and we proceeded to arrange the mountain equipment as fast as possible our instruments for determining altitude consisted of a special mountain mercurial barometer made by mr henry j green of brooklyn capable of recording only such air pressures as one might expect to find above twelve thousand feet a hypsometer loaned us by the department of terrestrial magnetism of the carnegie institution of washington with thermometers especially made for us by green a large mercurial barometer borrowed from the harvard observatory which notwithstanding its rough treatment by mr hinckley's mule was still doing good service and one of green's sling psychrometers our most serious want was an aneroid in case the fragile mercurials should get broken six months previously i had written to j hicks the celebrated instrument maker of london asking him to construct with special care two large watkins aneroids capable of recording altitudes five thousand feet higher than coropuna was supposed to be his reply had never reached me nor did any one in arequipa know anything about the barometers apparently my letter had miscarried it was not until we opened our specially ordered mountain grub boxes here in chuquibamba that we found alongside of the pemmican and self-heating tins of stew which had been packed for us in london by grace brothers the two precious aneroids each as large as a big alarm clock 
with these two new aneroids made with a wide margin of safety we felt satisfied that once at the summit we should know whether there was a chance that bandelier was right and this was indeed the top of america for exact measurements we depended on topographer hendrickson who was due to triangulate coropuna in the course of his survey along the seventy-third meridian my chief excuse for going up the mountain was to erect a signal at or near the top which hendrickson could use as a station in order to make his triangulation more exact my real object it must be confessed was to enjoy the satisfaction which all alpinists feel of conquering a virgin peak end of section two